Hello and welcome to my kitchen. Uh, I hope you're looking after yourself. I'm not going to lie, being creative in the lockdown is making me feel very much like a dad after a divorce. I've been making music and planning tattoos and occasionally just crying for no reason. Um, now, stand-up comedy is very much a live medium. It needs an audience, but for the moment and for the foreseeable future, that is not something we're going to get. Uh, more than anything in the world, I would love to go along to a new material night and watch someone with brilliant jokes absolutely bomb to an audience of idiots. I would, that would get me so hard right now. But that is not going to happen for some time yet. So I've combined two routines from previous shows, my Fringe debut, which is called This Is Not For You, and my 2016 show, Stop Children, What's That Sound, Everybody Look, It's Richard Brown. Yeah, I know, great title. Um, and I tried to assemble them into a new show in a new format that will hopefully work. Um, I did it in one take, so it should all the you know mistakes are in there. As if it were a live show, I do hope you enjoy it. And if you don't, that's fine too. There's plenty more to enjoy at this virtual festival. So without further ado. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to whatever this is in this weird world we live in now. Um, I do alternative comedy. The problem with that is people see comedians that live at the Apollo and they think, I like this. I like comedy. Let's let's watch some comedy. But it doesn't necessarily work out. It's like you're in it's like someone here in the killers and going, I like this. I like music. Let's go see some music. And you may be tuned in to see the killers, but what you're going to get is Pig Destroyer. Now, don't worry if you're not familiar with the works of Pig Destroyer. I can help you, right? They're called Pig Destroyer. Imagine what that might sound like. There you go, you've got it. So, this show might not be for you. Okay, let's get that right out of the way. People complaining that live entertainment wasn't entertaining enough is such a first world problem anyway, and I did have a whole lot more on that, but I wrote it all down in my phone and the battery died and it was just a whole thing. I'm never going to please everyone, That's and I'm fine with that. There are 7 billion people on the planet. I've done the maths for this. If you're one in a million, there are 7,000 people who are as good or better than you. So when I tell my wife she's one in a million, I'm not being romantic, I'm just keeping her on her toes. Yeah, that's mathematical misogyny. They say, treat him mean to keep him keen, so I treat them average. Uh, yeah, that is a maths pun. Very much a litmus test for the rest of the show. So, I watched a Harry Potter film for the first time at Christmas. And in it, there was a scene where the three main ones ordered drinks. And when the waiter brought the drinks to the table, they didn't acknowledge the waiter. They didn't say thank you, they didn't make eye contact, not the slightest acknowledgement. Now, I've not seen the end of the franchise, but I hope Voldemort kills the absolute shit out of them. Bunch of elite little private school fucks. I don't understand pop culture. I don't understand a lot of things. Um, I recently took an Asperger's test and guys, fucking nailed it. But because I don't understand pop culture, I try to keep up with the cultural zeitgeist by reading, but often... That's not a lot of help, because there's so much misinformation doing the rounds. Like the story that young people are offended by the TV show Friends? That's not true. What's happened there is some lazy journalist has found a few graduates of the Lena Dunham School of Mountaining Molehills, screen grabbed a few tweets to further vilify young people. I don't think that's fair. I think young people get a really hard time as it is. You keep hearing older people going, Young people today. Young people today have it so easy. Really, is that why you bought all the houses and won't fucking die? I rewatched Friends off the back of this story and. Right, I made a flowchart, okay? Joy, Kathy, Chandler, Monica, Joey, Rachel, Ross. This is the path of infection if, in the TV show Friends, Joey has a sexually transmitted disease. Um, it reaches all the main characters except Phoebe, but she'll probably die of a curable disease due to her belief in alternative medicine. Um, as I was, I was re-watching Friends, and there's an episode in the second series where the character Rachel is concerned because the gang have drank five bottles of wine between seven people. That's what that's what millennials should be bothered about. That's bad writing. That's not even a bottle of wine per person. Friends characters aren't even on the same level as a teacher. Kudos to Matthew Perry for showing the Friends writers what problem drinking really is. But like I said, I think young people have a tough time of it. 
and at least to older generations dismissing progress, you often hear people going, smartphones, they've made us so antisocial. Remember when people used to just talk? No. I remember awkward silences. I remember people not talking being a good thing. When I was 18 and I moved to Glasgow, I had dreadlocks. Yeah, I know. But I was on the subway and someone broke the silence to tell me to fuck off back to Pakistan. Now, I generally find racism horrible, but in this instance, I just found it very confusing. And this militant refusal to embrace technology baffles me. For a long time, compares doing crowd work would give couples a hard time if they met online. That seems to have ebbed away now, thankfully. But it shouldn't really have been a thing in the first place, you know? Meeting online is as common as meeting in a nightclub or a coffee shop or a bar or however people meet. I don't know, I don't go out. Like, I met my wife before Tinder was a thing, but I do think that if anything happened to my marriage, if anything happened to my wife, if I found myself single in this age of internet dating, and if I found myself single in this age of Tinder, I do think that I would prefer to die alone than meet someone on the internet. Have you been on the internet? You are on the internet. The internet's a horrible place. The internet's a place you go to take an idea you love because you want to share it and explore it and analyse it and ultimately have it destroyed by a homophobic teenager so sexually aggressive they compose messages by just slapping a cock against the keyboard and just trusting the autocorrect. You know, it's a horrible place. Social media, this jumped up teletext that lives in your pocket and your phone, but instead of planet sound, football scores and bamboozle, it's just pictures of cats and people's unfiltered opinions and things people have shared off the lad bible where lad is capitalised like a fucking vapid anagram. And if you're not familiar with the Lad Bible, then good for you, you're probably a good person. But if you regularly share content from the Lad Bible, go banter yourself off a fucking cliff. There's more pictures of cats, more unfiltered opinions, selfies people have taken in nightclubs that could be best described as meat markets if meat could have low self-esteem. That's not fair, that's better than us talking, because I don't like or understand nightclubs at all. You know, I, I, I don't trust confident people, is what it is. I hate the type of people that use chat up lines, the type of people that just walk up to folk like, hey, are you an angel? Because I'd like to finger you against a bin. But I guess worse, social media, this jumped up C-fax, has created a generation of people who think they can solve a refugee crisis by sharing a photo of a drowned child. Imagine before the internet, if someone had shown you a picture of a drowned child, you'd go, fucking hell, this is appalling, we need to do something, what can we do? You wouldn't just pass the picture on to someone else and go, well, I've raised awareness, so that's me done my bit. Back to BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed is the journalistic equivalent of a child's drawing in a shopping list stuck to the fridge, except the fridge is huge, the shopping list comprises entirely of things you don't need or can't afford, and the drawings are all shit and the children are all disappointments. I've written my own BuzzFeed article. Um, it's a list because... That's what they like. It's just um, simple life hacks. Tips and tricks to make life a little easier. Here we go. Life hacks for people who hate themselves. One cigarette takes two minutes off your life. Trouble sleeping? Any car constructed after 1995 will have a catalytic converter reducing the toxins. Run a pre-1995 car in your garage for some well-deserved bed rest. Save money on heating by warming the bath with a toaster while you're in it. Born before 1992? Don't worry, you can join the 27 Club at any age. Keep a card in your wallet with medical history such as blood type and allergies. If this information is wrong, the hospital will finish the job for you. A post-it note can be used for cleaning between the keys on a keyboard. It can also be used to give loved ones closure. Now, after all that positivity, it might come as a surprise to you that I used to be a goth. Yeah, I'll give you a second to picture that. Um, in fact, I could edit something in, can't I? So, uh, there we go. I was never really properly goth because leather and chains are expensive and I was too poor so I just looked like a grumpy transvestite. 
Like, forget Edgar Allan Poe. For the money you spent on subscribing to goth culture, you could instead use that money to just surround yourself with fake friends and therefore live a very genuine tragedy. Being a goth worked well for me because people would just assume socially awkward, unlike now where they come to realise it during conversation. I recently remembered something that happened to me during my teenage goth years. I was a little bit disappointed when I remembered it because I drink to forget and I drink a lot, but I was in a shop to get my face pierced and I was just making conversation but also genuinely curious and I asked the guy about genital piercings and the guy doing the piercings told me that he had 38, 18 on his cock and the other 20, well you figure it out right? I guess my face gave away that I found it difficult to comprehend the logistics of this. And without any real warning, he just decided to show me. And he just reached in and he pulled out... It had no discernible shape, it was just a handful of meat and shrapnel. Um, But I forgot about this for years. And I only remembered it recently when I was on a train and there was a sign above the toilet that said, Warning, magnets are fitted to toilet lid and seat. Yeah, I haven't really got a punchline that yet, it's just the image of a man magnetically attached to a toilet by his testicles. I kind of grew out of the goth thing, but I brought bits of it with me, you know. A lot of comics write coming of age shows because those shows are relatable. Um, When I turned 30, a few people suggested turning 30 was a big deal, but as, like, age, as we all know, age ain't nothing but the exact length of time a person has lived. When I saw my dad on my 30th birthday, he said, Well, son, that's you halfway to 60, how do you feel? I felt exactly the same. It wasn't a big deal. Maybe halfway to 60 was a big deal when he turned 30 and houses were made out of asbestos and polio, I assume. But it's fairly meaningless now. In order to reach 60, I'd have to live as long as I've lived up to that point all over again. And living up until that point was literally the most time I'd spent doing anything. I get incredibly uncomfortable when someone's asked their age and they go oh, over 21 or 29 again. It's, it says a lot about their own insecurities. And if you're going to be insecure, own your insecurities. If someone asks your age, go, I'm 34 and I worry that I'm running out of time to have children and I haven't started preparing for old age and the inevitability of death is just consuming my thoughts more and more. Or just... Just say your fucking age. No one's going to judge you for following the same rules of existence the rest of us follow, and anyone who does judge you for it isn't a person you want in your life anyway. So this isn't any sort of coming of age show. You see a lot of coming of age shows because growing up and growing as people is something we're all constantly doing, which is why those types of shows are relatable. But as I've already established, I struggle to relate to people. It's one of the reasons I can't do observational comedy. Which really shouldn't be my biggest concern about this personality flaw. I should be worried that my inability to relate to people means most friendships inevitably deteriorate and I'll probably die alone. But no, I'm just bothered there's a certain type of joke I can't write. So it means what I do is more like observational tragedy. You know, I used to bound on stage in clubs and just be like... So, I know what you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. Some of you, you're thinking, help, I'm a fraud and it's only a matter of time before I get found out. A little bit about myself, a little bit about myself. I use sarcasm and cynicism to push people away. And that's just the women. Get to know you guys a little bit better now. We'll get to know you guys. Uh, Give me a cheer if you have kids, yeah? Give me a cheer if you don't have kids. Give me a cheer if you can't have kids. I struggle to write relatable material. But I do still try and make the effort. I've been watching these competitive cookery shows you guys seem to like, you know? Mass Chef, Great British Bake Off. These competitive cookery shows are very, very popular. And I fucking hate them. I don't like them because of the competitive element. I don't like to see people reduced to tears for entertainment value. You know, Jeremy's dream is to be a chef because Jeremy's not very ambitious. And all he has to do to achieve that dream is prepare a seven course meal in six minutes out of five ingredients he's never seen before. These shows make failure inevitable and then point a camera at these people as they cry. And Great British Bake Off takes that same formula and adds jingoism. People use the term food porn. Food porn is the term used to describe the glamorised presentation of food. But competitive cookery shows aren't food porn. 
Competitive cookery shows are far more like real sex where one person is crying after failing to satisfy the other one. I, I don't eat meat, right? Can't remember why. Something to do with feminism or homophobia. Um, but I'm not going to judge you for if you eat meat. That's absolutely fine. If your perfect Saturday night in is a bottle of wine and a bucket of chicken to grease up your hands for a lazy finger, and then that's fine. You do you. However, I do feel that two of the worst types of people are people who are deliberately ignorant of where their food comes from and Morrissey. Um, a study by Consumer Reports purchased and tested 300 samples of ground beef totaling £458 from more than, 100 different 20, more than 100 different stores in 26 American cities. Fun little game, in your own head, have a guess what percentage of samples contained faecal matter. 100%. 100%. You don't know what's in your food. A hot dog's just a meat raffle you push into your face. For all you know, all that bread you buy is just salt, flour and dog's milk. When it comes to food, a lot of people are either ignorant or militant, and both are infuriating. You may remember a few years ago, there was a spate of people sharing images of wealthy Americans with the, corpse of, with the corpses of animals they've paid obscene amounts of money to shoot. Most famous examples are probably Cecil the Lion or Donald Trump's kids, but there are loads of them. Now, I have friends who are vegan, I have friends that are practically carnivores. And what I've learned about them when they share these images, what I've learned from the comments underneath, is that all of my friends are pricks. Vegans, stop using dead animals to promote your agenda. Meat eaters, stop pretending every bit of meat you eat comes from some super happy, free-range animal that wanted to be shot in the face to be your sandwich. I've seen you at two in the morning pushing kebabs into your face and enjoying it so much you have to fight the urge to just burst into a wank. Vegetarians need to learn that the meat industry and the dairy industry work together, so pick a side, you fucking hypocrites. And pescatarians, vegetarians who eat seafood, pescatarians can fuck off. Being a pescatarian is like giving money to homeless people with one hand and setting fire to abandoned buildings with the other. The suffragettes need to check their privilege. Now, that's my favourite sentence of the set. And I hope you enjoyed it, because I'm now going to take a moment to explain why I love it. One, suggesting the women who didn't have the vote, or indeed many other rights, suggesting they check their privilege is an absurd and ridiculous thing to do, so it makes me laugh. Secondly, a statement that's patronising also makes it clear that I know enough about and respect the suffragette movement to know about them burning down public buildings and the unoccupied homes of politicians. Uh, and the third reason I like it, telling people without privilege to check their privilege is a topical reference because of the current climate where class is an issue and arts become inaccessible to working class kids. So there's a level of social commentary there. There's multiple layers to that sentence and under each layer you find me being deliberately ignorant and ill-informed for the sake of a joke. Not as bad as pescatarians but still annoying are meat eaters who try to show solidarity with vegans and vegetarians. They go, I often go for the vegetarian option. I do, I do. If there's a vegetarian option there, I will often go for that. No, the meat option's there. You've made your choice and an animal died for it. You fucking eat it. How first worldly is that? Oh, yes, kill this animal. Not so that I may have food and sustenance, but so that I may have choice. Oh, I just couldn't live without steak. You're thinking of oxygen. You couldn't live without oxygen. When I used to perform this as a routine, in like, um, not really in clubs, but as a fringe show, I had meat eaters, vegetarians and pescatarians see that bit and come up to me after shows and try to justify their choices. But no vegan, which I found interesting because of the stereotype. You know the old joke, how do you know if someone's vegan? They'll fucking tell you, ha 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 ha, you know that one. Um, so to have none come up suggested the stereotype was wrong, you know? Or maybe they just didn't have the energy. Boom! There we go. I can do that fucking hack shit. Hey, why are vegans clothes creased? They lack iron. Come on! I, I'm not vegan, even though I don't eat animal products. I don't eat animal products because it's the second best thing you can do for the planet. The first is not have children. Although they got bumped from the top two spots when a friend pointed out you could just fucking kill yourself. 
So I don't eat animal products. But I don't use the word vegan because I don't consider it to be part of my personality and I think labels like that are restrictive. One day when the lockdown's finished, I might be walking home a little drunk, I might eat a pizza, you know? I'm still better than you. But as evidenced by my consumption of cookery shows and Harry Potter and Friends, I have made actual efforts to understand pop culture. Back in the early 10s, I read the literary classic that is Stephanie Meyer's Twilight, a series that has sold over 100 million books and is the story of a 100-year-old creationist vampire who spends an entire novel grooming a high school girl for sex. Um, I'd like to read you a quick excerpt now. It's written from the perspective of, Be perspective of Bella. You already know how I feel, of course, I finally said. I'm here, which roughly translated means I would rather die than stay away from you. I frowned. I'm an idiot. You are an idiot, he agreed with a laugh. Look, to be fair, I don't think this book's aimed at me. I think it's aimed at women who know their place. Now, if you're not laughing at that, good. That's the correct response. It's meant to be ironic sexism holding a mirror up to that book and the way it portrays women as weak and needy, but I'm not sure how much weight you can put on irony as a defence. You get these comics who go, oh, if you were offended, I was being ironic, but if you take, take this at face value, I'll still take your money and not pay any tax on it. Which takes me back to what I was saying. There's seven billion people on the planet and a lot of them are fucking idiots. Which leads me on to sport. Um, in last year's Grand National, three horses died. That's more than one in 20 participants dying. I think we can all agree we need to do something. We need to introduce those odds to football. That would make their fucking salaries worth it. Because let's be honest, the term sports personality is an oxymoron. And look, I'll be honest, at a base level, I actually enjoy sports. I just don't like the laddish culture around them or the way the biggest sporting events are packaged as a celebration of nationalism rather than athleticism. I have no interest in the Commonwealth Games. We're told it's this wonderful coming together of countries to celebrate sport and achievement. It's not. The Commonwealth Games are just the result of the British Empire going, we own these people, let's race them. I do love the Winter Olympics. I think it's because I never took part in any of the sports as a child. You know, I know from childhood that I am off foot football and rugby and running and roly polies, but in my head, I am a fucking bobsled ninja. It is an undiscovered skill that I probably have. But in 2014, the Winter Olympics were in Russia, which has these atrocious anti gay laws in place. And the brand sponsoring the games released statements along the lines of some people support gay rights, some people are against them. Whatever your view, we agree with you. But for all the homophobia, the games themselves were wonderfully camp. During the opening ceremony, each country was led out by a woman wearing a great big Priscilla Queen of the Desert headpiece and these rings that looked like something out of retro 60s science fiction. And these outfits looked like they'd been made for drag acts. Which is brilliant. I'm not saying they look bad on these women, I'm just saying they would have looked better on me. Two years earlier, I watched the opening ceremony for the London Olympics with with stoic Scottish cynicism and the intention of writing jokes about how shit it was, but after half an hour I found myself sitting in front of the TV going, off oh, for fuck's sake, this is really good. But then so much of the coverage of the actual events was just a patriotic circle jerk sponsored by McDonald's and Coca-Cola to leave a legacy of type 2 diabetes. I enjoyed the Olympics, but I missed my foot. We should be using sport to bring everyone together. One of the cool things about doing comedy is that you get to meet people from all over the world. And sometimes you even get to travel to perform comedy, which is very exciting. So there's fringe festivals all over the world, in like Canada and Australia. I was actually very lucky last year that I actually got to go to Paisley. I went to Paisley's one main tourist attraction, which is Glasgow International Airport. Um, I have a few fears in airports that I have to deal with. I'm afraid of flying. But I'm more afraid that when I go through security and I take off my shoes and my belt that I'll then take off my trousers through force of habit. But I made it through security, fully clothed, and um, I went to Australia, I went to Melbourne. Melbourne's a cool city, man. They have a swimming pool named after a Prime Minister who drowned. 
That's amazing. That's like if we named tunnels after Princess Diana. And look, if you found that joke offensive or just in poor taste, that's fine. It's fine if you're offended. It's fine if you weren't. Offense is subjective. 1997 too soon, was it? Fine. We all get offended. I was staying with a friend a few years ago. I was up early in the morning. I was the only person up watching the news. And there was a story on the news about a politician who'd said gay people should go get cured. And I was getting angrier and angrier at the stupidity of this politician. And then the story, as, as my anger built, all of a sudden the TV and all the lights just went out. And upon investigation, turned out uh, we just needed to top up the electricity meter. But for a brief moment, I thought I was Matilda. And it was amazing. It's good to travel. I went to the, uh, the Isle of Lewis and the Outer Hebrides a few years ago, experienced Hebridean hospitality, which is an actual thing, not like Glaswegian hospitality, which is another oxymoron. When you get there, they immediately offer you something and you ask for maybe a cup of tea or some toast or something and they take that cue and they go, okay, cool, I'll just make three cakes. You, you help yourself to the whiskey. So you're sitting there with a whiskey in anticipation of cake, which is possibly the best feeling in the world. And there's no disingenuous chat about the drive. Oh no. First question about the journey. How is the crossing? Yes. Immediately makes you feel like you're in some sort of fantasy novel. The, Isla, the, Outer, the Outer Hebrides are basically like Game of Thrones, but with more incest. Now, that joke, very much the pot calling the kettle black. Because I grew up in the Scottish borders, right? Um... I don't know if it's true, but my history teacher told me that the Scottish borders has the highest ratio of old people to young people. People go there to die like it's some sort of inefficient dignitas. Um, it was a very uninspiring place to grow up. Near my hometown was a farm called Crumstains, and we never thought to remove the R from that sign. You know? A friend told me once that he knew someone who walked past a sign every day that was just asking to be vandalised. He couldn't remember what was on the sign, but for the sake of the story, let's say Swanker's Walk. And every day, this guy walked past this sign, and no one ever vandalised it. Until after about a year of passing the sign every day, finally someone had taken the initiative. Someone had just painted over the whole sign and written the word fuck. You've got to distract yourself, whether it's through art or music or petty vandalism. You've got to distract yourself. Because we live in a society where people are taught to hate each other as a distraction. You blame young people or immigrants in, a very, in what's a very basic divide and conquer technique that we keep falling for. We live in a society where hugely popular teen fan fiction, or teen fiction rather, teaches young girls that they need a man to protect them. And where I have to explicitly express that I'm being ironic for fear of fuck-knuckled idiots taking what I say at face value. A society where sporting success is more important than tackling homophobia. My coping mechanism is to take these things and try to look at them in a different light, try and make jokes in a way that maybe makes someone laugh. Although the reality is, at this point, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. But I want to end by quoting something Maya Angelou said in conversation with Dave Chappelle when he asked her why she isn't angry. She said this, if you're not angry, you're either a stone or you're too sick to be angry. You should be angry. You must not be bitter. Let me show you why. Bitterness is like a cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. So you said anger. Yes, you write it. You paint it. You dance it. You march it. You vote it. You do everything about it. You talk. You talk it. Never stop talking it. Thanks for watching, look after each other, and go create.